All right, so let's talk about uh, acute coronary syndrome. So when you're, talking about, when you're talking to somebody who you think might be having a heart attack, right, what kind of questions do you ask history-wise? What are you looking for in their history? Yeah, have they ever had this before? What else? History of hypertension, smoking. Drinking. Diet, exercise. Yeah, what's their lifestyle? Cocaine, drugs. Yeah. Good. You're trying to stratify where this patient is at. Now, when you're asking about what kind of symptoms they're having right now, what kind of questions are you asking? Where's the Sure. OPQRST. Right, the OPQRST, right? So we're typically talking about our middle aged man here, right? All of those questions. The high blood pressure, smoking, hyperlipidemia, uh, lifestyle, obesity, whatever. That determines that individual's lifetime risk. But it doesn't tell you if the person in front of you is having a heart attack right now. They could have some of these. They could have none of those. That doesn't mean that they're not having a heart attack in front of you right now. So make sure you understand the difference between predicting somebody's lifetime, lifetime risk and the risk that they're having in, in ACS right in front of you. So the questions you'll ask are the OPQRST questions. Was the onset during, ex was it exertional, right? Where is it? Does it radiate anywhere? Uh, and the timing, right? So chest pain that lasts longer than 30 minutes is probably more indicative of an ACS or more concerning for ACS, acute coronary syndrome, than would be like chest pain that lasts for two or three minutes and then keeps coming and going, right? All right. When you're doing your exam, Things that should make you a little more concerned, if they're diaphoretic, right? So where I trained in Phoenix, nobody sweats in Phoenix, right? Um, it's just so dry out there, out in the desert, whatever. So if you have a patient come in and they're still pouring sweat, that's a problem, right? Why are they doing that? Their fight or flight is still being activated. What's that? Specifically, right? that median sternotomy, right? So this is somebody who's had a heart attack before. That's obviously going to put them in a higher risk category than if not. Uh, you can hear heart murmurs. Anybody remember the Kentucky for like an S3? The Kentucky, Kentucky. When you listen to the heart, it da-da-da, 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 right? There's, just listen, and instead of hearing two distinct sounds, you're hearing three. And what's happening is, is because that ventricle isn't moving as well, it's stiffer, as the blood slams into it from the body, it kind of makes an extra sound when the blood hits the inside of that chamber. Imagine taking like a water bottle and sloshing it forward. That sound as, it, as that water sloshes forward and hits. Okay. Uh, crackles maybe in the lungs. What's that telling you? Right? They're getting fluid, meaning they're getting, what, where's the fluid coming from? Right? Left-sided heart failure. Right? So the heart's not squeezing as well. Now they're starting to get a heart failure. That's a more concerning sign for a much more severe type of ACS. All right, what's this? Right? I think this is actually a normal patient, too. I think this is just the way she's built. That's a crazy picture. Anyway, uh, I bet she passes out every time she takes a dump. <laughs> I mean, all of her vascular volume is right there. Okay. JVD, which is telling you what? Right-sided. Right-sided heart failure, right? Because now the blood's backing up into the rest of the body. Okay. And then hypotension. All right. When you're talking to somebody and they're describing their chest pain to you, there are some things that they'll tell you that should lean you more towards, yes, this might, this has a higher likelihood of being an acute coronary syndrome, and some things that says, well, this may be lower likelihood of it being ACS. Not zero, but lower likelihood. So we call that a predictive value. So if it has a positive predictive value, with these numbers over here to the side, then it has a higher chance of actually uh, telling you if that person's having ACS or not. If it's less than one, then it usually less likely to be the case. So what do we mean by reproducible chest pain? Uh, like exertional, they can get up and they're like, oh, walk up the stairs, make my chest hurt. Right, that would be exertional, so that's definitely, that would be more positive. Reproducible uh, is like they say, oh, it's really sharp, and if you push right here, it hurts. So you go on their chest and you push on their chest. Is that the pain you're having? And they say, yes, that's the exact same pain I'm having. Reproducible. Right, meaning you can cause uh, conditions that the, that that pain is is reported as positional. Right, we'll talk about this in a minute. If it hurts more when they lay down, feels better when they sit up. Maybe what's pleuritic chest pain? Yeah, so they take a deep breath. 
And whenever they take a deep breath, it hurts more, right? That's maybe a lower likelihood. All right, they're sweating. It happened during exertion. Radiating to both arms and to the right arm actually has the highest prediction. So I know typically we're always taught it radiates to the left arm, the left jaw, right? But if they're saying, oh man, the pain shoots over to my right arm, that's a lot more concerning than even shooting over to the left arm. Okay, anginal equivalent. So you get this sweet little lady comes in and she says, oh, hi, honey. Yeah, you know, I, no big deal. My daughter finally made me come in. Yeah, I've just been feeling tired and run down the last few days, you know? Just, just kind of out of it, a little bit of heartburn maybe, right? Okay, don't let that sweet little old lady fool you. She is trying to die, okay? We call these anginal equivalents. The most common being fatigue, right? just feeling run down. Maybe they got a little bit of heartburn, right? Uh, maybe they've just felt a little nauseous the last few days, right? Any of these anginal equivalents are also should be treated the same as if somebody comes in and says, yes, I have crushing left-sided chest pain that radiates to both arms. You should treat that the exact same way. So don't let her lull you into a false sense of security. People that have atypical chest pain are, typically, are going to be like your elderly, your diabetics, women, or those with mental health conditions. Why mental health conditions? How good is a schizophrenic at telling you what's going on inside their body? Not great, right? Now, the other three voices they have might be able to give you some insight, but that patient isn't going to be able to give you a whole lot of insight most of the time. Right? Okay, so different types of MIs. Usually what everybody thinks about with an MI is what we're going to call a type 1. That's really not as important. I just want you to know there's different reasons for people to have heart attacks, okay? Typically, what you guys are thinking of is like this guy, right? You've got this stable plaque. It's just kind of hanging out there in the middle of the heart. Blood can still get through it. And any time that guy goes for a walk, he gets chest pain. That's stable angina, right? It's predictable. Every time I walk two blocks, I start getting chest pain, right? Now that same guy says, you know, every time I walk two blocks, I get chest pain. Except this morning, I'm sitting there, you know, I'm drinking uh, my coffee and eating my toast. And all of a sudden, I get just this most horrible chest pain. It feels like my chest pain, but I wasn't doing anything, right? So what's happening there is that you can be getting this little clot that'll transiently rupture fill up with some blood, right? And then it dissolves or goes away. So it's just like this transient block or a transient worsening, okay? This is bad because it can roll into this. It's like a non-ST segment elevation. So there's still a little bit of blood flow past there or a complete occlusion, right? Now, somebody had mentioned cocaine, right? You're talking about asking the patient if they had cocaine. So if that would be more like a type 2 where you're getting vasospasm, meaning that if we went in and did a PCI, so we went in to cath this patient, and we were injecting dye into the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are clean, pristine. There's nothing there. But yet that patient is having ST elevations on their ECG, right? It's from that temporary vasospasm. There's some other diseases that will do that too. So if a lady comes in, and uh, you know, 45, whatever, she says, yeah, you know, every morning for the last couple mornings, I've just been getting this horrible left-sided chest pain, nausea, I break out in a cold sweat, and then it goes away. Right? She could be having something called prismental's angina, right? where she's just getting that vasospasm that's happening on and off. Right? Cocaine's kind of a big deal, though. What receptor does cocaine work on? Anybody know? You guys remember alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2, alpha-2? Right? It's adrenergic, so it's working on one of the, those are all adrenergic receptors. So this is working on alpha-1, right? So it's causing squeezing of those blood vessels tight. So if, if somebody comes in and they've got super high blood pressure, what are some medicines that we like to throw at those people? Betalol. Like libetalol, right? So libetalol is a beta blocker. So now you put this beta blocker in the, on top of cocaine, and you've blocked all the beta receptors, but you've left that alpha receptor wide open. What's going to happen is their pressure is going to go from 180 over 90 to 230 over 112, right? You will have just made things so much worse, right? So cocaine, chest pain, they get benzos. All right. Sometimes the body has such high demand. So think about like the worst heat stroke you've ever seen, right? And the heart's doing everything it's supposed to. The coronary, coronary arteries may be fine, maybe have a little bit of plaque. But because that heart has to work so hard, so beyond what it's capable of, 
that they start showing signs of ACS. They might even have EKG changes. They might have that ST elevation of that STEMI. Now, maybe they're having a heart attack and they passed out in the heat and that's why they have heat stroke. Or maybe they had heat stroke first and they just failed a stress test, right? Because what do we do on a stress test? On a stress test, we take somebody with a partial obstruction, we put them on a treadmill, we increase the demand beyond what they're able to perfuse, and we look for those ECG changes, right? And we say, aha, as soon as I put you on the treadmill and I get your heart rate up and get you working hard, you start having signs of a heart attack. That's a positive stress test. You need to go get a cath, right? So sometimes your patients will do that for you. It's very courteous of them. And I say that because you get a heat stroke patient come in and you look at their EKG and it looks like a STEMI or they've just got diffuse depressions, looks like injury, right? What's the primary problem? Their core temp of 104 or their heart? Which one do you need to fix first? Or the, the core temp, right? Fix the hypothermia first because the ECG changes may be secondary to that. Don't get fixated on that and call the cath lab and rush them off to the cath lab. Meanwhile, their core temp is staying elevated and you're not taking care of that problem. All right, so when you look at a cross section of the heart, you've got the blood vessels that sit over the top, right? You have the coronary arteries. And then off those coronary arteries, they shoot down the little capillaries off to the side that'll feed the different levels of the heart, right? So the top layer of the heart, we call the pericardium, right? The myocardium. And then the bottom part is the epicardium. So if we take the myocardium, we further split the myocardium up. There's the middle part, there's the subpericardium, the subendocardium. So the subendocardium is the part that's furthest away from that coronary artery, right? So if I block the coronary artery, I'm going to first start having problems down at the bottom, here at the subendocardium. So if you look over here to the side, this is normal. We get a small blockage that's starting to form in there. First, I'm going to get this wave of ischemia. My T waves are going to flip upside down, okay? If that continues to progress, we're going to get injury. So now those heart cells are starting to die. So at about two hours, you're losing about 500 myocardial cells per minute, right? Or per second, I'm sorry. Let that go a little bit further. And now those cells just die off altogether. They start exploding, rupturing. You're never going to get them back. It's going to get replaced with scar tissue. Okay. And that typically is happening there at the subendocardium. All right. Now this is a little bit backwards. The color should be on this side. But at any rate. So you start off with a little bit of ischemia. Right. T waves will deepen. ST starts to come up with that injury. As I start to develop more infarct, now I'm starting to get a Q wave. Right is that injury progresses, that ST elevation just keeps getting higher and higher. Eventually, you're just gonna infarct through that whole area and you'll get that permanent Q wave and in a couple weeks, the T wave will come back up right. right. So there's that natural progression from T wave inversion, ST elevation, marked ST elevation, and then eventually uh, presence of a Q wave and then eventually the T waves return to normal. One note here, heart cells get kind of pissy when they don't get enough oxygen. And a pissy heart cell likes to send off all kinds of electricity. So instead of having just the AV node driving the, driving the train, you could have this part of the heart that's being, let's say it's infarct down here. As this part becomes ischemic, it'll start sending off signals and that's where you're gonna get your VTAC, VFib, whatever, okay? Oops. All right. When you're looking at the 12 lead, remember the different zones will tell you what you're looking for. Leads two and AVL are probably the lateral circumflex or the diagonal, okay? So like over here, diagonals, all right? Septum is gonna be like the LAD or anterior, also LOD, LAD, sorry. And then the lateral circumflex, again, back over here to the side. This right here, is either going to be inferior, because remember the inferior part of the left ventricle is typically fed by the right coronary artery. If you see ST depression here, so the ST comes way down and goes up in V1 and V2, 
that would be more concerning for like a posterior. Okay. So, how do you define a STEMI? That seems like that should be simple, right? But it's not. There's some nuances to that. So what defines an ST elevation MI? How much elevation do I have to have before I call it? Five millimeters? One little box, yeah. One little box, so one millimeter. One? Mm -hmm. one millimeter and at least two contiguous leads. So what do we mean by contiguous leads? These groups, right? One millimeter in any of those groups. The exception being these here. So in V2 and V3, for men less than 40, we allow up to two and a half. For women, one and a half, men over 40, we'll allow up to two. That gets a little confusing. From the test, most of the time, just remember uh, one millimeter of ST elevation and at least two contiguous leads. That's yeah, so Scarbosa criteria only applies to left bundle branch blocks. That's a good question. Okay. Um, That's why I answered it. That's what yeah. What you want to see in Scarbosa's criteria is discordant ST elevation. So what I mean by that is, is if you look, let's go back to, and that's important because you'll see a lot of people with left bundle branch blocks or pacemakers. Okay, so right here. All right, you see how the ST elevation is going in the same direction as the QRS? Right. Right? That's concordant, right? Meaning with. Discordant would be if I have ST, they don't really show depression here very much, but like where the QRS is going this way and then my ST is coming down, right? That's discordant. So on a left bundle branch block, they should have discordant elevation or discordant depression. So whichever way the QRS is going, that ST segment should be depressed or elevated the opposite direction. That's normal, up to five millimeters. If it's more than five millimeters, you call it like you would a, uh, a STEMI, okay? The exception to that would be is like if you see concordant ST elevation or de concordant ST depression on somebody with a left bundle branch block, that's also an MI. But that's, they're not gonna test you on that. That's way above and beyond. How many of you guys were taught to ignore AVR? AVR. I'm just going to tell you right now that's a lie. We'll talk about why in just a second. All right, so take a look at this. What's going on here? Right? Concord, all right, is it uh, contiguous or non contiguous? Here, here. Here, here. So it's contiguous and at least four leads, right? And look over here. We have reciprocal depression. So reciprocal changes means that whichever leads are opposite. Think about whichever leads are opposite of the leads that you're seeing elevation in. Look in the opposite set and see if there's depression. So typically anything that's left-sided. So even if you've got it over here, this is like an anterior septal, right? So let's look inferior, there's our depression, and then there's a little bit there in V6, and a little bit maybe in one. Okay, you might have some questions on that, I don't know. I think not as many about telling where the MI is, but just keep in mind contiguous is what you, you need to know. So what's going on here, take a look, tell me what you think. All right, fast or slow? Fast. Okay, where's it coming from? Sinus, junctional, or ventricular? Sinus, Sinus right, because we see P waves. You see the P waves? Okay, so this is sinus. Okay, good. Is there QRS wide or narrow? Narrow, narrow. narrow. good. Do you see any uh, inverted T waves? Maybe, right? 
Okay, what about ST uh, elevation? Do you see any ST elevation greater than one millimeter? So we've got elevation in AVR, and you've got diffuse depression. Look at where we have all those depressions at. Almost the whole ECG, right? That's an MI. But I know a lot of you guys are taught, ignore AVR. Don't ignore AVR. This is either triple vessel disease, a proximal left main, or left circumflex. This is bad. All bad. So I have a question. Regarding for ST aggregation and ST depression, what's the, actually the difference between them? Because both of them are MI. So like depression here. So what you do is, is you'll take, you see how there's this, let me find a good example. Let's go back to this one. You see how there's this line right here? If you were to draw that straight across, so a lot of times what you'll see some people do is they'll take, they'll take the EKG and they'll fold over the bottom so that they use the bottom of the EKG like a straight blade or a straight razor. Uh, and then you follow that line across. Okay, and you ask yourself, does that ST segment stay at about that line? Does it drop below the line? If it drops below, it's depression. If it's coming above, it's, it's uh, elevation. Before we talk about this, let's talk about this. So what are you gonna do with these people? What do they need? You've got somebody with ACS, what do they need? Make, break it down simpler. There's a blockage to perfusion, so they need, they need something to open up and reperfuse, right? So we just call it a reperfusion strategy. We have two reperfusion strategies. One is going to be with the thrombolytics, right? And then the other one is going to be PCI. So thrombolytics would be like uh, TPA, right? Um, different countries will use different things. But here we use, we use TPA. All right, so we've got some time limits on this. First off, the symptoms have to be within 12 hours. If it's greater than 12 hours, they may end up going down just a medical management path where we put them on aspirin, Plavix, and like a heparin drip. And we just let the body dissolve the clot out and be done with it, okay? Keep an eye on them, watch them. But if it's been less than 12 hours, your job is to get them there as fast as possible. In the ED, we have 10 minutes to do all of this stuff up here. Chest x-ray, EKG red, um, starting uh, lab work, whatever. As well as activating the cath lab uh, usually you're supposed to have, yeah, activate the cath lab. Because once they hit the door, it's 90 minutes from the door to get them into the cath lab and have that balloon open up the first time. Not 90 minutes to the cath lab, not 90 minutes to activate the cath lab, 90 minutes till the time they open the balloon. 60 minutes to push TPA. Now, you may ask yourself, well, what if I'm three hours away from the nearest facility that can do a PCI? Right? You're going to hit... You're going to hit the clot buster. You're going to hit the thrombolytics, the TPA, to try to bust open that clot and then ship them to do, get PCI. So for you guys, if you're out in the field, for whatever reason, if you should have access to that type of stuff, somebody's having an MI, I would definitely call, talk to somebody about it, you know, try to send them some pictures if you could. And then you would have that discussion, yeah, let's push TPA as long as they don't have any contraindications, uh, and then ship them off, and then PCI is still an option. I think that's the take home, okay? So this is a very much time sensitive. Where they're going to ask you questions on the test is if a patient was been presented for more than 12 hours, like it's been two days, right? Well, that's different. Less than 12 hours, yeah, now you're on the clock. All right, aortic aneurysms. What's going on? You guys heard of these? So what's an aneurysm? Yeah, why does it happen? Yeah, it's like a hydraulic hose, right? If you have a hydraulic hose under pressure for too long, it's going to blow. First thing that's going to happen is it'll weaken. It'll stretch out, okay? Uh, greater than 3.5 centimeters is where we call it an aneurysm. They need surgery somewhere around five. All right, that's for an abdominal. Thoracic may be a little bit different, but it's close, okay? Um, if you guys, you guys have ultrasound? You can actually learn to look for these with ultrasound. It's actually very, very helpful, especially if you're out in the field and you have somebody coming in and you think this might be an issue. This would be a good thing to learn. Uh, you got to shoot through the bowel gas. That takes a little bit of learning. But what you're going to do, though, 
see this outside rim here? That's the outside wall of the aorta. So when you're measuring it, you have to measure it from the outside wall to the outside wall. This right here, all this gray stuff in between, that's blood clot. So as the blood is flowing through this area, it's kind of like when you hit one of those, those widenings in a small creek, right? As you come into that opening, it's kind of fast, but once it hits that wider spot, it slows down a little bit and it sort of makes those little eddy currents through the, that little cove or whatever to the side. The blood will do the same thing. And over time, it starts to form a blood clot in that. So you get what's called the false lumen, which is that opening right here. So where people get into trouble is they measure the opening of the false lumen and they say, oh, it's normal, and it's not. Okay, uh, triple A's. Again, if you're out in the field or if you're taking care of a contractor or whatever and you find out that guy's got a five centimeter aneurysm or a five and a half centimeter aneurysm, keep his blood pressure under control. Do not pass go. Get the heck out of there. That guy needs to be seeing a CT surgeon, you know, CV surgeon. He doesn't need to be out there. Because if that thing ruptures, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, bust out the beads, you know, last rites, that's it. All right, aortic dissection. What's an aortic dissection? Mm -hmm. So same kind of thing, right? We get this weakening in the abdominal or in the uh, aortic wall, either thoracic or abdominal. And instead of that weakening causing a dilation, like an aneurysm, what happens is, is that it gets a tiny little tear in it. So you gotta imagine as the blood's coming out of there, think of it like a punching bag, right? Every time the heart beats, it's punching the aorta in the throat, okay? And after a while, if it's hitting hard enough with that increased afterload from that Frank Starling curve, and if it's hitting fast enough, it can, it can rip a tiny hole in that lining. And once it rips a hole in that lining, then it can start to send blood down in between the layers of the aorta. And so you'll get this false little aneurysm off to the side, kind of what this is showing here, right? And that can go all the way down. Now keep in mind, what's coming off? What are these right here coming off the aorta? Right, carotids? Brachiocephalic, right? So if I disrupt blood flow to the carotids, how's that patient going to present? Or alter metal status. Stroke. This is a stroke. Okay. Or what if I come down and I dissect into the renal arteries? Now what are they going to say? Maybe they've got renal failure. Maybe they come in and they tell you I'm pissing blood. Right? Maybe they come in and they tell you, I've got flank pain. So I've got chest pain, but I've also got flank pain now. What if it dissects? So it's hard to appreciate on this, but if you look at a CT scan on a contrast study, you can see these little blood vessels that come off of the aorta that feed the spine. Right? If I dissect one of those out, how might that present? Maybe back pain. Right? Imagine... I'm causing a cord injury, a spinal cord injury, high in the thoracic section of it, right? Maybe T7, T6, whatever. How's that going to present? Paresthesias. Maybe cramping, right? So I've seen, I've seen two dissections. The first one I saw, uh, the guy came in, said he was uh, masturbating, and he all of a sudden had some really sharp chest pain and cramps in his legs. By the time we got him to, uh, and he had a STEMI, because it was dissecting back into the coronary artery, the right coronary artery. So you looked at his EKG, it looked all the world like a STEMI. So STEMI on EKG plus chest pain equals ACS. He went to the cath lab, they did the cath lab, saw that it was a dissection, sent him over to CT scan, uh, and he had already dissected into one of it, both kidneys. And essentially it was killing both kidneys before you could do anything about it. Right. So, and that's not uncommon either. They'll tell you that they had sudden onset, right? It's so like a subarachnoid hemorrhage, sudden onset. The pain was maximal when it started. And there's usually some other symptom with it, right? So that's why I have this up here, this chest pain plus one. That's what I want you to remember. Chest pain plus one, right? Chest pain plus back pain or flank pain. 
chest pain plus numbness in the legs, right? Chest pain plus loss of radial pulses, right? Chest pain plus a delay in pulses from upper extremities to lower extremities, right? Chest pain plus something else should make you think aortic dissection. This is also a really bad one because what can you do about this? Not a whole lot. So remember that every time the heart beats, it's punching the aorta in the throat. So let's get the heart to back off a little bit. So what can we give to make the heart not beat so strong? Maybe. What can we get it to slow down too? Custom channel blockers. What's the other one? Beta blockers. Right. So beta blockers are your go-to. These people are typically hypertensive. So you're going to start with your beta blockers, and if it's still high, then maybe you give them nitro or nitroprusside or something else, hydralazine, something else to decrease their blood pressure, right? Keep the heart from beating up the aorta so hard. All right. The other way you can get a dissection, let's see if that's going to play, is this. So what's that chest doing? Right. So as that chest slides forward and hits the steering wheel, you got to remember all the squishy stuff on the inside of that skeletal cage is still moving forward. The skeleton stops, the squishy stuff keeps sliding forward. And it actually, because of the way the heart's hung on there, you get a little bit of a rotation to it and a little bit of a spin. And that's what will cause your dissection. And you can have either just a tiny little tear in the inside lining, you can have a little bit of blood that gets in there, but then it blocks itself off. Or you can have a complete dissection or a complete interruption, except for just that outer lining. These people arrive to the hospital alive. These die on scene. I mean, think about it. If you have a complete disruption of the aorta that high up, they're going to bleed out. Nothing you can do about it. What do they do for grade three? Believe it or not, uh, they can do surgery for those. They can try to graft them. Maybe they can try to stent them. Maybe they can, but your job is going to be keep their blood pressure under control and watch it close. Like this isn't the person that you want their blood pressure going back up to 140 or 160. You want to keep them closer to 100. You want to keep their heart rate closer to 60. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's just a hard fart, and then it ruptures. Okay, you guys have all seen this before in pneumothorax. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, I thought this was just a nice video, but I think you guys have seen that before too, I'm sure. This I thought was kind of interesting. How'd you like to have that patient come in? Hey, doc, my chest is a little sore, you know. You know, have you ever had any surgeries? No, no surgeries. Then you take it. What about this? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I had heart surgery two weeks ago. Just keep in mind, though, that you don't have to have penetrating trauma to have a pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax. Okay. So, and have a pretty low threshold for darting somebody's chest. Will you cause a tension pneumo by darting somebody's chest? By darting it, sir? Yeah, by doing needle decompression. If you do a needle decompression, are you going to cause a pneumo, a tension pneumo? No. Think about it. This right here is sucking chest wound, right? Physics is physics, guys. Physics is physics. Remember when you were having your airway lecture, we talked about how any increase or decrease in diameter changes the resistance by a factor of four, right? So in order for air to preferentially enter the chest instead of going through the esophagus or the trachea, it has to be at least half the diameter of the trachea. I mean, that 14 gauge is a big needle. It's a big angiocath, but it's nowhere near half the size of the trachea. So you're putting that needle in there and that angiocath is not going to cause a pneumothorax. Assuming, of course, you don't stab too deep and punch into a bronchus or something like that. Okay. So, since we're talking about that, what size needle are you supposed to be using? It's a 14 gauge. How long? Three and a quarter, right? At a minimum. Okay. You could use bigger than that, but that's the minimum standard, right? If you hub that in a young, healthy adult male, you bury it, and then you pull the needle out. What percentage of people are you going to stab into their ventricle or bronchus or pulmonary artery or take a guess? How many? What percentage? Probably all of it. A lot of zero. 
a lot of 25 percent, around 22 percent. Yeah, the Brits did a study where they did CT scans and they looked, they measured the distances on young, healthy people. This doesn't count people that are a little floofier, your standard American. Um, but on young, healthy adults, about 21, 22 percent, you're going to stab into something you don't want to be into, right? So that's why it's important as you're doing it. It's just like doing an IV, right? You're going through just until you feel the resistance decrease, and then you slide the angiocath forward to take your needle out. And then when you're teaching other people, make sure you're watching them, right? Because people get all amped up on adrenaline. They'll hub it. Go spear fishing. All right. Have you guys seen those chest tubes that come on a long trocar? Right? That's the same problem they were having with those, too, is that people would get kind of amped up. They'd be putting a lot of pressure in there, and they wouldn't have good hand position on the end to keep it from sliding in, and they would go from one side of the chest wall to the other chest wall. That's a bad day. It's generally frowned upon. All right, PE, this is what we talked about with that DVT on one side. What's this right here? Uh, yeah, it's a saddle embolism, right? So this should all be nice and white, just like this uh, contrast in here. But that's a clot that's actually extending across to both pulmonary arteries and to both lungs. So how's that patient going to present? What are they going to look like? Yeah, they get almost, they almost get like a superior vena cava syndrome when you see them come in. So like from the, this far up, they're sort of this purplish look or purplish reddish look, like somebody's been choking them out or something. Yeah, short of breath, right? You're going to look at their heart. If you were to do an ultrasound of their heart, you see that right ventricle right there? That's way too big. It should only be a fraction of maybe half that size. All right, again, that right ventricle is almost the same size as the left ventricle. It should be about half to a third of the size, not the same size. Okay. If you have a clot that big, is oxygen going to make a difference in their saturation? No. Potentially not, right, because this is a shunt. You can't overcome a shunt with oxygen. All right. Why is that? Because you're not getting the blood flow to the lungs. If you're not getting blood to the lungs, it's not going to pick up oxygen. It doesn't matter how much oxygen is in the lungs, which is important when you're talking about kids with cyanetic uh, congenital heart defects. So again, take a look. See how both sides look almost the same? That's not right. Okay, esophageal rupture. So this is the guy that's been uh, tossing the lunch monkey pretty hard for the last little bit. All right, so maybe you guys that's been boozing it for a while. It could be your binge drinker, it could be your chronic alcoholic that now has alcoholic ketoacidosis, whatever, right? This is somebody that is just throwing up so forcefully, so hard, that they rip a hole through their esophagus. Once that happens, you see this side right here? So this is the costophrenic angle. You see how it's nice and sharp and deep on that side? But look over here, right? It's, you don't have that same depth. It's not as sharp. It's filled with fluid. That's because all that is going down into here. What's this? You guys see that? There's a light colored line, a dark colored line, and a light colored line. What is that? Also, look over here. What's light colored on an x ray? Why is this light and this dark? I'm sorry, why is this dark and this light? Dark's air. Dark's air. So, that's air. See that dark line right there? Right? They get air in the mediastinum. They'll get something called Hammond's Crunch. So you're listening to their heart, and it sounds like their heart's eating Rice Krispies. Okay? You hear that crunch, crunch, crunch. Right? Or you'll look on their neck, and you'll be pushed around on their neck, and it's like that Rice crispy. Anybody ever felt that? Subcutaneous emphysema? I had. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> okay. That's not good. <laughs> I think I can guess what happened there, but okay, that sucks. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, so if you see that, and this stuff here on the side, you see how there's that little kind of dark stuff that's interspaced in there? Not here. That's also air tracking along through the skin on the outside. So you can push on that person's chest, and all through there, they've got that crunchy kind of rice crispy uh, feel. It's a sickening, sickening feel. 
hard to miss. If you look at them on CT scan, it fills up with fluid. So what's, gonna, what's this patient going to look like in about two days? Yeah, maybe bloated. Okay. Fever, no fever? Absolutely septic, yep. Because what's in all that gastric contents, right? There's all kinds of bacteria in the food, in the whatever, right? Not to mention now you're taking all that acid, potentially throwing some acid in there as well. Okay. So these people get septic. They get septic really fast. So these people come in looking like the worst case of pneumonia maybe ever. But they have a ton of chest pain. They have a story of throwing up beforehand, right? And they might have that Hammond's crunch. Okay, which brings up another point too. When you guys are taking care of your patients, always play the differential game, right? You get your chief complaint, and off that chief complaint, right away, you should be able to build a list of differentials, right? right? So for like chest pain, the things you should be looking at, the acronym is PETMAC, right? It's the things we just all talked about right now. Uh, but build that, and then maybe add some other things, but always be playing that game of what else could it be. Don't anchor. Do you guys know what anchoring is? Let me talk to you about that, cognitive biases. You're sitting on one, right? Yeah, it's where, it, so that, that guy, that other guy comes in, right? He's saying, oh, I have a little bit of chest pain. Yeah, it hurts when I take a deep breath. He's got a fever of 103, right? He's coughing, and you're going to anchor and say, oh, it's pneumonia. No problem. I'll treat you with some antibiotics. No big deal. He dies two days later, right? So that's why you always be playing that game in the back of your head. Yeah, you might be right, but ask the rest of your questions. That's why when I see a patient and I ask them my review of systems, I ask all the review system questions, right? So the guy could come in with chest pain, but I'm still going to ask, you had any nausea vomiting recently? Throwing up any blood? Pooping any blood? Right? You're looking for those other things that doesn't fit your diagnosis that you're coming up with. All right, last thing, or one of the last things here, tamponade. What's going on in tamponade? I think you guys already talked about this with heart failure. Right? So in order to have tamponade, you have to have Di uh, diastolic dysfunction of the right ventricle. So there's the right ventricle right there. You see that funny movement it gets, how it's kind of dipping in a little bit? So it's supposed to be relaxing. When it relaxes, it should be filling up. But what is it doing? The left side is, is relaxing and filling up, but the right side looks like it's contracting. It's not that it's contracting. It's trying to fill up. But the pressure from the fluid in that pericardium is so great that it's collapsing that right ventricle. And that's why you don't get that forward flow. So we talked about four different types of shock. What types of shock is this? Obstructive. Obstructive, right? Because the heart muscle itself is fine. It just can't get anything out. Or in this case, can't get anything in. So this is an obstructive shock. Some things you might see on this, you might see uh, Beck's triad, which is they'll have the... Uh, Big JVD, uh, they might have like pulses paradoxus, they have hypotension, right? The other thing, you might listen to the heart and it might sound really distant because you've got to go through all that fluid to hear it, right? Or if you look at an EKG, you've got a big spike and then a little QRS, a big QRS and a little QRS. And that just repeats that same pattern, big, little, big, little, big. What's happening is you're getting a big QRS when the heart beeps out towards you and then it relaxes. And then the next time it beats, because there's so much fluid, it's beating away from you. And so the electricity looks different in between each one. It's kind of rare, but if you see it, that's what it is. There's Beck's triad, muffled heart sounds, hypotension, JVD. Nice to know. You'll only see it in less than half the patients. So you know all these, you guys have had to memorize other triads, like this triad, that triad, whatever, right? They'll make you memorize those. Typically for almost all of those, they're only present about half of the time. Yeah, that's reassuring. Yeah. Uh, same thing with, I think the next one is. Yesterday. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So reasons that cause it. This could be from any number of diseases. Uh, if you're overseas, think tuberculosis. You can get dissection that'll come back into it. It could be that they had an MI and the whole ventricle died or a big section of it died and then it just exploded. And so now the ventricle is just bleeding out into the pericardium. They could have hypothyroidism. They could have just uh, end-stage renal disease. Maybe they have a history of radiation treatment. 
Or they could have had the flu recently. Or not even the flu, they could have had the common cold. And they had pericarditis, and then it caused a tamponade. Or they come in with a knife in their chest, and the cause is obvious. Which is one reason why if you get somebody with penetrating, penetrating trauma into the chest wall, there's some argument that one of the first things you should do is to grab that ultrasound, put it on top of the heart, and look for that, that effusion, pericardial effusion around the heart. Because that would totally change your management, right? Now we're talking about potentially a crash thoracotomy versus we're going to keep doing all these other things in our primary and secondary service. That's not going to be on the test, but just FYI. All right, pericarditis. Anybody here know somebody that had pericarditis? You ever seen pericarditis? This is caused by the common cold. Echoviruses, adenoviruses, uh, Coxsackie viruses, right? What happens is the heart gets infected or the lining around the heart gets infected, and then that potential space in between the, the visceral and the parietal layers, right? You're supposed to have a little bit of fluid in there, just like the lungs. It keeps the friction from building up, lets things move around and slide like they're supposed to. But when that top layer of the heart gets pissed off and inflamed and infected with that virus, or, and then it dumps a ton of fluid in there, and you can get like this on the ultrasound. So you see that, that thin layer around there? So this is heart wall, but that thin layer right there is fluid, and that bright white line right there, that hypoechoic line, or hyperechoic line, is the pericardium itself. I would argue you guys need to get good at looking at the heart. You need to know the FAST exam for sure, but you should also know something called the RUSH exam when you're learning ultrasound. So a RUSH exam is similar to that, right? You're going to look at both sides. It's like an E-FAST, so an extended fast. You look at both sides for a pneumothorax. Look at the bases of the lungs for fluid, right? You're going to look at the IVC to see if the tank is full or empty. And then you're going to look at the heart. Squeeze, no squeeze. Effusion, no effusion. Right? RUSH exam for undifferentiated patients in, in shock. All right, other things you might see on the EKG, diffuse ST elevation. It's not just one or two leads. It's not just two contiguous leads. It's almost the whole ECG has ST elevation. There's a few things that you can look at to try to tell the difference. I uh, won't go into that right now. This usually goes classically in a series. It'll start off with PR depressions which is kind of hard to see in this EKG, but if you look at like P wave and the QRS, so that little space in between there, that'll be depressed. And then you'll have ST elevation. Uh, that starts first, and then the T wave flattens out, then it becomes inverted, and then it goes back to normal. You might see them in any of those things. So just because you have a normal EKG, or you just have T wave inversions, they could still have pericarditis. Classic story, they'll tell you they were sick recently or they had some of these other diseases that may cause that, end-stage renal disease, radiation therapy, whatever. And they'll tell you that it feels worse when I lay flat, but if I sit up and lean forward, I feel better. It hurts when I take a deep breath. All right, endocarditis. You guys see all these right here? So bacteria will be floating free in the bloodstream, and if there's any kind of irregularity on these hearts, let's say a congenital heart defect, or maybe atherosclerosis, or some kind of injury to that valve before in the past, then that bacteria will latch on there, it starts to grow, the body sees that, it tries to scar it off, it doesn't work, bacteria continues to grow, and then sometimes the bacteria will start to break free. So if it's on the right side of the heart, right, let's say it's on the tricuspid valve, and you've got these bacteria that are just breaking free, where is all that bacteria going? In your body, circulation. Which part of your body? It's on the right Ball side of the heart. Into your lungs. Into your lungs, right? So that patient's going to present with this weird pneumonia. You're going to get a chest x-ray, and they're going to have these patchy spots or abscesses on both sides. That's not normal. You don't see that typically in a pneumonia. Maybe in an AIDS patient, right? But you shouldn't see that in a normal, otherwise healthy person. So that should, be, that should tip you off. If it's on the left side, where is it going? Into the vasculature. Yeah, the rest of the body, the rest of the vasculature. So you can get these things, these Janeway lesions. You look at their hands, they're on the bottom of their feet, and they've got these red knots. It almost looks like a pustule maybe, or maybe it's flat and it's red. Janeway lesions don't hurt. Osler's nodes, Osler's is ow. 
Again, you probably don't have to remember that. Just remember that, look on the palms, right? Look on the fingernail beds. You'll see these things called splinter hemorrhages. What's happening is, is either a piece of scar tissue or a piece of bacteria is floating in and it gets stuck at one of those capillaries right there at the end. And it blocks it off and infarcts. It kills off all the tissue south of it, right? Which will either give you those nodules, right? Or those infarcts. You can also see it in the back of the eyes too if you're doing your fundoscopic exam, potentially. And if you're looking at ultrasound, if you're lucky, you might see that. Drug users will get this. Most people, it happens on the, we'll say the left side of the heart. In drug users, it's more frequent on the right side of the heart. I think that's right. Because they're injecting directly into their veins, and that's the first place it hits. And a lot of times, it'll be skin flora in your drug patients, especially MRSA. That's bad, bad business. Most people don't do well. Saw a girl that had, uh, she had already had two valve replacements and came in with those abscesses in both lungs and a big empyema. So this whole side of her chest cavity was pretty much pus. And her heart valve, her artificial heart valve was already infected again. There wasn't a surgeon in town. This was in Phoenix. Not a surgeon in town that would touch her. Because she had already done it twice and she hadn't quit using drugs. It's kind of sad. All right, last thing to think of. Somebody comes in, they're diaphoretic, they're leaning forward, they're saying, oh man, sharp, sharp pain, right here. Every time I take a deep breath, it hurts. I was just mind, you know, I've been having some heartburn for the last few days, uh, and now it's just killing me. Like, this is the worst pain I've ever had in my life. I've never felt anything like this, right? They could be 21, they could be 55 and have COPD and a history of heart disease and everything else. What's going on? is that you can perf one of those ulcers. And then all that acid goes into the stomach and you get this peritonitis. But it may not show up like a peritonitis. It might not show up like that kid with belly pain and appendicitis, right? They may be coming in with chest pain because that air is sitting right up underneath the diaphragm and all of this underneath the diaphragm and around the stomach is just really irritated. And so that's where they're feeling their pain. Where's the, I'm sorry, where's the pustula that you were talking about? Perforation? So the stomach, stomach, right, anywhere in the stomach or the duodenum. Okay. So anywhere along this area and about it through here. Is that, pep, you said peptic ulcer disease? Peptic ulcer disease, yeah. Because GERD presents with reflux? Correct. But they'll usually have a history of GERD, right? Because you're not just going to get peptic ulcer disease out of the blue. Usually it's been simmering for a while. Um, and again, I've seen this in kids, as young, people as young as like 21. So it can happen. Uh, the one that stands out in my mind, though, was a 55-year-old, I think, came in. He had a history of COPD. He looked like a COPD exacerbation, right? Leaning forward, couldn't breathe, was breathing super fast, kind of pursed lip breathing, tripoding, looked like COPD. We got a portable upright, and that's what we saw. Sudden switch in diagnostic pathways, call the surgeons, get them out of there, okay? But again, don't anchor. Don't anchor. All right. Any questions on anything that we covered?